Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. The book, my new book, um, begins with a story from Joseph Conrad, uh, a writer I admire very much, and who I, in some ways, think is one of the greatest 21st century writers, even though he wrote the story uh, that I quote over 100 years ago. But he's a great 21st century writer, and that his subject matter is civilization and barbarism, um, reason and the uh, um, attempt to make life more reasonable against a background of decaying imperialism, um, contradictory tendencies in Europe, terror, and fanaticism of various kinds. The New Statesman will be having a centenary uh, uh, edition shortly. It was opened, it was founded in 1913, 100 years ago. And one of the things I think one gets from reading Conrad is how many respects there are in which our situation now is similar in the world to what the situation was in 1913. There have been many changes, some of them for the better. The partial emancipation of women and gays, the development of democracy in many parts of the world, uh, large increases in standards of living uh, uh, for uh, hundreds of billions of people. But other things are the same although there are different players, geopolitical struggles for natural resources, wars of ethnicity and territory, the return of religion as a central factor in political and even military conflict. The world is rather like that of, um, in those respects that Joseph Conrad wrote about. And the story I mentioned in the book is one less well known than Heart of Darkness, but it's based on some of the same experiences which Conrad himself had and the same phenomena that he witnessed. He went to the Congo, the Belgian Congo, and when he was there, he saw what was being done in the Congo um, under the aegis of uh, Leopold uh, of Belgium, which was one of the great atrocities of the early 20th century. Um, millions of uh, the inhabitants of the Congo were, um, their lives were ended or shortened in various ways, which ranged from simple murder to torture, starvation, overwork, something like a genocide, which by some accounts could have accounted for, difficult to tell, but about possibly a fifth of the population were killed. And it was a very formative experience in Conrad's life. You can read about it in the diary he wrote when he was there, which has subsequently been published, often in editions of, in, uh, of uh, Heart of Darkness. He said, before I went to the Congo, I was a mere animal. I thought that was wonderful, if you reflect on it. What he meant was he was a normal, civilized human being. And what he confronted in the Congo was a variety of things which emerge in his later work. One is, if you like, the fragility of civilization. That civilization can be disrupted and um, break down rather easily. But something actually more profound than that, which is that civilization can itself be at times a vehicle for barbarism. Because the... Uh, um, uh, Congo, uh, Belgian Congo, the um, committee which um, Leopold and his financial backers set up to exploit the Congo, to exploit its peoples and kill them off when they were no longer needed, was called um, the Committee for Progress and Civilization. And, the, and there was a sense in which I think they did, in fact, kind of believe that. And the sense of it is brought out in the story, which is called an outpost of progress, about two, two traders who go to Africa, gradually lose their habits of work, um, lose their identities. They go there believing that they represent an, a higher civilization, an advancing civilization, one powered by science and knowledge, one which is uh, getting greater and greater power over the material world, and which thereby, in some sense, represents human advance, and that other civilizations are other peoples or other parts of the world in which uh, this has, hasn't reached yet, should be 
should be uh, energized by it, uh, should be uh, uh, um, incorporated in it, and to the extent that they can't be eliminated. So the start of the book is that story, and the reason I started that way is it, it brings together two things. One is the idea of civilization and its connection with what I call the myth of progress. Now, obviously, the myth of progress that um, Leopold and his committee held, in which the character were, were, were possessed by, and the one that the characters in Conrad's story were also possessed by, was an imperialist myth. It was expressed, the vehicle was a form of imperialism. Um, but the core of the myth was essentially this, growth in, of no human knowledge in science and growth of human power through the expansion of knowledge, through the increase of, of knowledge in technology is in the long run, over time, uh, linked with growth in civilization or advance in civilization. Whatever happens in the world today, whatever ecological or other disasters might befall the planet or the human species, <clears throat> we're not going to go back to a period in which universities teach alchemy or astrology. And we're not going to go back to medieval science. That's been left behind. The errors of science, once they've been uh, um, falsified and once the, the elements in them that are true are incorporated in science, science moves on, they're left behind as pre-scientific thoughts are. But Conrad believed, and I believe, that in civilization, or if you like, in ethics and politics, this is not the case. Things are learned in ethics and politics, but they don't stay learned. The difference between, or one of the differences between progress in science and technology, which is a fact. The difference between that and um, advances in civilization is that the lessons that are learned in um, ethics and politics are invariably lost and forgotten. So, and I think one of the examples of that, which was the, something that happened in the lifetimes of most of the, everyone in this room, actually, which is the sudden rehabilitation of torture, which occurred coming out of the um, Iraq war and occurred, furthermore, not in some uh, tyranny of which we didn't know very little, but in the world's preeminent liberal democracy. The prohibition was deeply entrenched in international treaties and laws and expectations. And if you'd said 10 years ago that the vice president of the United States would defend a torture technique, as um, the vice president of uh, as Cheney subsequently did when he said he didn't regret anything to, didn't regret the liberalization of, let's call it the liberalization of American practice on uh, waterboarding. If you'd said that that would happen in 2003, it would, have, it would have been seen as a perverse exercise in willful pessimism. That is essentially the myth of progress. It isn't to do with whether or not things have improved. Things have improved in many respects in the last 100 years. Um, it's to do with the idea that the long-run impact the myth is that the long-run impact of the growth of human knowledge is to make the world, human life, more civilized. That's the myth. And practically everyone who says they don't believe in this myth do. Conrad, and I sort of take the view, is that the growth of knowledge uh, is very powerful, but what it produces are new forms of civilization, re recurrences of old, and new forms of barbarism. So it's not that there is a slow tendency, however weak, however partial, however fallible, however slow, with however many regressions. It's not that there's a slow tendency to make the world more civilized. It's that the growth of knowledge simply enters into the conflicts of the world, the ethical and political and other conflicts of the world, and produces, as I believe it will do in this century that we're in now, it'll produce perhaps new civilizations which are, in some respects, superior to the ones we know, and it will produce new types of barbarism that are worse than the ones that the world currently contains. Now, I'll come to the second point of what I have to say. Uh, there is a sort of contrary to view to the one I've suggested now, citing Conrad. Much of the book looks, I should say, at the lives of particular people who have been caught in situations where incremental progress, gradual progress, the sort of progress everybody believes in, was impossible. People like Arthur Kersler, in many ways a monster, but an interesting person, 
who actually lived through the collapse of civilization in Central Europe, traveled extensively in Nazi-occupied Europe and in the Stalin Soviet Union, and a number of other people who've lived in times where melioristic advance, piecemeal advance, gradual advance, incremental slow advance, which everyone believes in, wasn't actually possible. I think that was Kersler's insights, one of the reasons that Anglo-American liberals don't like him, is that he, uh, he, 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 I think he grasped the central point, which is that in order to have incremental advance, you have to have background institutions that are more or less legitimate, that people will work in and come to some kind of, uh, having achieved one thing, they'll move to the next kind of thing that they might agree upon, or at least reach a compromise on. And for that to happen, you also have to have the main groups in society with sufficiently convergent goals and interests. And that wasn't true in interwar Europe. Politics was polarized, center parties couldn't hold the ring. Um, most of the social classes had been ruined. And there were new movements of ethnic nationalism alongside revolutionary movements from the left, basically fighting it out. And Kersler understood, and his analysis was that in Europe at that time, incremental progress was impossible. What the only kind of human advance that could occur would be after absolutely cataclysmic conflicts and wars. And in that, of course, he was correct. Now, there is a view nowadays against what I've been saying which says that societies and even economies and human life in general evolve. In other words, there's a very widespread use now of the ideas of social evolution, that just as the idea is that there's evolution in species of the kind Darwin identified in natural selection, so there is some kind of evolution in society. There are more or less evolved kinds of societies. And um, this is not, of course, the first time this is idea has been popular. A hundred years ago, it was hugely popular. And at that time, as now, it suffers from certain uh, fatal Ill kind of difficulties. In the first place, in Darwinian evolution, the whole point about natural selection, it doesn't have a goal of any kind. It's not going anywhere in particular. It's non-teleological. If you really applied an idea of evolution to society, you would have to apply, and you applied it consistently in a Darwinian way, you would have to conclude that societies are going nowhere, which I think is in fact the case. Where they go depends on the multiplicity of human decisions and choices and habits and behaviors in the society, but there are no laws about it. If you think that there is some sort of inexorable or semi-inexorable um, uh, evolutionary pressure pushing towards global capitalism, which Herbert Spencer the late 19th century uh, person who actually invented the, the phrase the survival of the fittest. It didn't come from Darwin, it came from Spencer. He thought that. But he had the great misfortune of living a long time. And by the time he was in his old age, he, he was seeing not rising free markets, not laissez-faire, but rising imperialism, the Boer War, all the things he hated. And he was sort of, he died in despair. Now, all these ideas have come back. And there are people who sort of seriously believe or seriously talk as if um, there is some kind of global evolutionary tendency to, um, to free markets and to capitalism. One of the reasons you should be suspicious if you're interested in this line of criticism or questioning about ideas of social evolution is you'll find whenever they're advocated that social evolution is moving towards the goal that's currently fashionable. So towards the end of the 19th century, it was laissez-faire capitalism. Spencer uh, advocated very... He, by the way, he had a tremendous um, campaign against public health. He held that the building of sewers and cleansing of waters was a... Cleansing of the water was a conspiracy of uh, bureaucrats and that there was actually uh, no real reason for doing it. I wish he'd written a book I could have done for him called The Myth of Diarrhea. But... Um, <laughs> So he was a kind of hard case. Then his disciples, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, founded the LSE, where I was, had spent 10 happy years, um, held to the same view. But then they said, no, it, this is the 30s by the time they said this. He's absolutely right, Spencer, about evolution. But it isn't that tending towards less of a capitalism. It's tending towards the Soviet Union. 
That's when they introduced their book, The Soviet Union, The New Civilization, which in the first volume, this is true, had a question mark, a new civilization, second mark, they took it out. I used to say there was a third volume, very hard to find, which had an exclamation mark, but that's not, <laughs> that's not actually true, so I can't. But there was a second one where it was taken out. Later on, of course, Soviet Union, some of the horrors of it come out, eventually collapses. You can't really say that it's all tending towards the Soviet Union anymore, so you get people saying instead it's tending towards an idealized version of American capitalism circa about 1987. Then you have the financial crisis, 2007, 2008. So basically what you find is that the local, parochial, temporary, ephemeral conception of what's good and progressive always turns out to be the goal that evolution is pushing towards. 50 years from now, it might be slavery again. But the fact that this idea has come back leads me to my concluding theme, which is what I start with, which is that errors in human thought in general, in ethics and politics, in human civilization and culture, are not like errors in science. Errors in science don't, don't usually come back. We won't see an article in uh, Nature saying, by God, Nostradamus was right. <laughs> um, whereas the exploded fallacies of a previous generation in human thought more generally, in human culture, like this idea of social evolution, always do come back. And that's why in my book I kind of conclude by saying you know, if human rationality was really a scientific theory, if we approached the idea that human beings are even potentially reasonable and rational, and that the increase of knowledge would increase human reasonableness, if we had that, if we treated that as a scientific theory in a truly critical way, we'd have abandoned it and dumped it in the trash can of history a long time ago. Thank you. So I want to start by asking you about Mm. Moral progress, that second, mm. second kind of progress. Um, because some of, your, some of your critics seem to get, get mm. very exercised about your claims about the myth of progress. Mm. Um, and I think we've seen some of this in uh, a number of the reviews. Um, there's, a, there's a common objection which runs like this, which says that you don't have to believe that tomorrow must be better than today to try to make it so. That's such a common objection that mm. I'd like you to respond to it directly. Sure. If you can. It's a very common objection. All believers in progress, uh, in piecemeal progress especially, rather than what Orwell called catastrophic gradualism, which is progress in disastrous jumps. He said that in the 30s, many intellectuals became believers in what he called catastrophic gradualism. But if we just think of the kind of progress that liberals believe in, gradual piecemeal progress, um, assumes that something which I believe to be false, which is that once certain advances have been made in certain areas, democracy has been achieved. Against that background, um, further progress can be achieved. In other words, the idea is that what's been achieved at any one point is relatively fixed, relatively irreversible. Not completely irreversible, but the, idea, it's, the whole idea of a piecemeal or, or incremental progress is of step by step, and that presupposes that what was there before remains largely in place. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, historically speaking, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So that's you know, that kind of obvious, you know, Criticism, what I say, so it doesn't get the point. It's not, that, it's not that we can't improve, we can't make things better for a while. It's that what is gained is very easily lost and in, and in over a longer period will be lost. It's a very interesting remark somewhere where you say that um, it's, uh, we shouldn't think of barbarism as somehow unnatural. Mm. That seems to me mm. um, an absolutely crucial insight. It's a crucial thing, yeah. Just as civilization is natural for humans, mm. so is barbarism. That's to say, the idea that people have, in, that human beings any, have a kind of instinctual revulsion against living in a barbaric way, that's to say, with violence, persecution, fear, threat, revenge, torture, the idea that there's something in us which is stronger than the civilized impulses, I, re I regret, I, I reject. I think they're both in us. This is an important point, which is that they're both in human beings, so that there'll never be a point at which, there's another argument about progress, in which the, the appeal of barbarism, which it unfortunately always has, especially in times of stress, there'll never be a point in the human future in which the appeal of barbarism disappears. So um, I'm sure you'll want to join me in thanking John Gray for a extremely stimulating talk. <laughs>